Well, hello, folks, and welcome to Faith Baptist Church in Canton. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to our midweek service. And so uh, between myself and Brother John and Pastor Bedwell, uh, we're going to begin a study through the book of Philippians. And so I get to kick things off. And uh, so let's open with a word of prayer. And then uh, maybe you want to pause this for a moment and get your Bible and turn it to the book of Philippians. And we're going to go through verse by verse and see what the Lord has for us. But before we begin, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do ask your blessings upon this study. Uh, Lord, I know it's uh, uh, kind of a weird circumstance with everybody not gathering in your house, but Lord, uh, we are gathering together electronically, and so we ask your blessings upon the word. Uh, be with our folks now, and uh, Lord, those especially that may have physical needs, that you'll uh, uh, bless them, heal them. And uh, Lord, we just ask your blessings upon our nation and our leadership during this time. And uh, we ask that you put a hedge of protection uh, around our folks. And uh, again, be with this Bible study in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so by way of introduction, uh, as most of you know, I am a history nerd, and so I have to give a little bit of a background. So the book of Philippians, as the title might imply, uh, Paul wrote this letter to the church at Philippi. So Philippi is in Greece and uh, named after Philip of Macedon. Now, Philip of Macedon was Alexander the Great's father. Now, without getting too far down in the weeds here, there are some interesting things uh, with Philippi. Uh, before it was named Philippi, it was uh, named Crenides, uh, a very Greek sounding name, which means little fountains. So there's a lot of hot springs around the city of Philippi. And uh, it was named Philippi, again, as I mentioned, after Alexander the Great's father. Uh, now, Philippi was actually kind of a backwater until a very important event took place, the Battle of Philippi. And the Battle of Philippi took place in 42 BC, and that's where uh, we have uh, Antony and Octavian uh, defeating Brutus and Cassius at the Battle of Philippi. And so if you, if you reach back in your memories to your ancient history class, uh, you know, Brutus, you know, Julius Caesar's play, uh, Shakespeare's play, Julius Caesar, Et tu Brute, uh, where Brutus was one of the ones that conspired to kill Julius Caesar. And, uh, uh, Julius Caesar was Octavian's uncle and had it in his will that he would succeed to the uh, throne uh, in Rome. Well, you had these factions fighting. Well, finally, uh, you had Antony, yes, Mark Antony of Antony and Cleopatra fame, uh, and Octavian defeating Brutus and Cassius, and that ended the Roman Republic and ushered in the Roman Empire and Octavian became Caesar Augustus, right? So you kind of put that in perspective uh, of, of world events at that time. Now, Paul is in prison in Rome when he writes this letter to the Philippian church, okay? And he writes that letter uh, roughly 60 to 62 AD, so like a hundred years after the Battle of Philippi. Uh, Philippi had become a uh, Roman colony and had a higher status, although it was in Greece, uh, it did not have to adhere to local government uh, and it modeled itself after the Italian cities, uh, particularly Rome. And a lot of the soldiers from the Roman army, especially those that followed uh, Octavian, uh, settled there in Philippi. So the heavy, heavy Roman influence. And uh, you'll see some of that. There's a flavor of that that comes through when Paul writes to the Philippians. The Philippian, uh, the church at Philippi had a special place in Paul's heart. He loved them and he loved them dearly. 
and you see that come off the pages as we read through here. So, all right, uh, we'll, we'll put away the history lesson and let's get to scripture. If you'll follow along with me. It begins in verse 1, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. So uh, he starts out Paul and Timothy, servants, that, act, that word could actually better be translated slaves. Uh, Paul considered him a slave to Jesus Christ, uh, a slave to the gospel of Jesus Christ. He would do anything for Christ and for the, and for the, the proliferation, the promulgation of the, the gospel. And so he writes to the church at Philippi, and he also mentions the bishops and deacons, the leadership, okay? It's important that the leadership got what Paul was trying to say, because there's a lot of doctrine here, and there's a lot of teachings about who Jesus is. And so he goes on in verse 2, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting to note that grace and peace are always uh, intertwined. The grace of God brings forth the peace of God. And so uh, Paul invokes that as he opens his letter to the church at Philippi. And then... We go to verse 3, and I love this verse. I thank God upon every remembrance of you. Wow. What do people think about? What, what kind of a reaction do people have when they think about you? Are they grateful? Are they thankful? Do they have joy when they think about you? Or is it something else? Well, it's in interesting to note that Paul when he thinks about the church at Philippi and the brothers and sisters in Christ there, he's grateful for them. Let's continue on, verse 4. Always in every prayer of mine for you all making request with joy. And again, that, that joy, and by the way, Philippians is a book of joy, all right? And he starts this out, I, I'm, I'm thankful for you. When I think about you, it brings joy to my heart. Why? for your fellowship in the gospel, verse five, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, from when Paul was there and he established the church, we can go back uh, again into the book of Acts and you can read about uh, in Acts chapter 16 where Paul was in Philippi, until now. Now, Paul is in prison in Rome and it's interesting to note Paul's condition and Paul's reaction to his condition. He, it's going we're going to get to this in a little bit, but Paul is in chains in a prison in Rome awaiting trial. He's, he, he's going to end up being there for two years. Yet, Paul is filled with joy even under adverse circumstances. And I, okay, um, I don't think any of us are in chains uh, we're not in handcuffs, our, our hands aren't tied up, but sometimes it almost feels like uh, we're in prison, right? Uh, we've been, our governor has just issued a uh, shelter in place order. Uh, we're not to go out, and so sometimes it might feel like <laughs> we're in prison. Uh, but if we compare our circumstances, dire though they may be, uh, doesn't really compare to what Paul uh, was experiencing. Yet Paul was filled with joy and he was an encouragement, not just to the soldiers around him and to Caesar's household, but also to other Christians. And would to God that we were a blessing to those around us, even during trying times. So back to verse five, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, and then you come to one of the most popular verses in the book of Philippians. Being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And most of us can quote that verse by memory, but it's interesting, being confident, being sure, it's something we can 
we, we can very uh, assuredly place our hope and our trust in that he, Jesus, which hath begun a good work in you. Well, where did that work begin? At the moment of salvation. At the moment of salvation, Christ and his spirit began to do a work in us. What is that work? Conforming us to the image of his son. He began that work and we can be confident that he that began that good work will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. And that's what that means. He who began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, there's an interesting turn of phrase here, the day of Jesus Christ. You know, in the Old Testament, over and over and over again, you hear about the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. And that is a day of wrath and a day of judgment where God pours out his judgment. However, when it talks about here in the New Testament, and I believe it's used four or five times in the New Testament, the day of Jesus Christ that's that final salvation, that final reward, that final glorification where we, we actually become perfect and mature in Christ. He will perform that work of sanctification. He will conform us to the image of Christ. And we, we have confidence that Christ will do that. Verse 7, even as it is meet for me to think this all of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye are all partakers of my grace. Now again, here's where Paul mentions, and we have confirmation that he is in prison. He is in bonds, and he's saying, hey, church, the Philippian church, you're with me, you've supported me, you've prayed for me, you take part in my bonds. You're part of this mission, you're part of this message of the gospel. And it brings Paul a great deal of joy, okay? I have you in my heart in as much as both in my bonds and in a defense and confirmation of the gospel, you're all partakers of my grace. Verse 8, for God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. Paul had a, a strong desire, and that, that's an interesting note. We don't use that, uh, the, the bowels of Jesus Christ. Uh, and I think most of us know this. Uh, that, that's a, a biblical term for the seat of emotion. Okay, we say, I love you with all my heart. Perhaps a Jew back in the first century is, I love you with all of my bowels, with all my guts, right? But I think you get what I'm trying to say here, and what Paul's trying to say. Uh, he, he longs after them, he wants to be with them, he loves that fellowship that he had with, and again, it's denoting that relationship he had with that church at Philippi, a very special relationship. For God is my record, how greatly I longed after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And I pray, and this I pray, that your love may abound, okay? And yet more and more in knowledge and in judgment. And it's interesting, <clears throat> knowledge and judgment going together there, right? Um, we have some that, uh, well, they, they may read scripture and they have a lot of knowledge, but they never use it. They never rightfully discern and use the knowledge they have from scripture in their everyday life. But there are those that go out and they're very judgmental, but they don't have the knowledge behind it. And there's a, there's a symbiotic relationship. I hate using that term. It's overused, I think. But here it's appropriate. There's a symbiotic relationship between knowledge and judgment. It's taking the word of God and being able to apply it properly to the situations we have in life. And Paul is praying that the church, the church at Philippi, might I say us today, the church of God today, that we abound in love 
and more and more in knowledge and in judgment. Why? Why? Verse 10. And here's where we'll, we'll go through verse 10 and we'll wrap it up here today. That ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Now let, let's break that down a little bit, okay? So why does Paul want our love to abound? Why does he want our knowledge to abound? Why does he want our, our, our judgment to abound? That we can approve things that are excellent. Well, what are things that are excellent? Well, things that are found in Scripture, right? That word approve is an interesting word. Um, another word we might use, and in the Greek, it's, it's that we can assay. A-S-S-A-Y. Uh, my lights just went out. There we go. Thank you, John. John's here, by the way. Say hello, John. Hey. Do <clears throat> uh, you remember, you, you like Westerns? I love Westerns. As a matter of fact, you know, while we're under self-quarantine and a shelter in place, I plan on watching some Westerns. Um, I like them. And you know, all the old Western towns had an assayer's office. And if you don't know what that is, and a lot of you know, I used to live in Arizona, lived in Arizona for 10 years. There's a lot of old Western ghost towns out there that we would go and visit. And some of them have been recreated and they have the old gunfights that still, you know, the actors do that sort of thing. And they have an assayer's office because there are a lot of gold mines. Well, silver mines, copper mines, and all those sort of things out West. And you would take, if you were, were panning for gold or digging for gold, you would take your gold into the assayer's office and they would test it. They would test it to see if it was the real deal and not fool's gold, okay? Well, that's the same kind of idea you get here in verse 10, that you can approve, that you can judge, right? We just had that word, that you can judge, make sure it's the real deal, that you may approve things that are excellent. Okay? As Christians, we strive to live an excellent Christian life. And, the, you, and that ye may be sincere and without offense. Now that's, and I've done a Bible study about this before. It may have been a Wednesday night back at the old building. And some of you may remember about that word sincere, right? It's two Greek words, sine, sere, okay? Sine, me, S-I-N-E, means without. And sere means wax. Sincere literally means, the word actually literally means without wax. You may say, well, Brother Dan, what, what does that mean? Uh, the Bible's telling us to be without wax. So that doesn't make a lot of sense. Well, it does if you think about the culture, okay? A lot of times, dishonest merchants would take their pottery and keep in mind they didn't have uh you know uh, glasses and and bowls and and uh, thermoses and you know i've got my i've got my coffee mug here right it's nice keeps things hot they didn't have that type of thing uh they what they had was pottery and they had a lot of it <clears throat> so uh, a dishonest somebody who was less than um uh, forthcoming would, would have an imperfect piece of pottery and what they would do is they, they would fill in the cracks with wax okay and then they would paint over it and they would set it up in their shops and you would come in and if you know it's dark or in the shadows in their shop uh, you would walk by and oh this is a nice piece of pottery I'll buy this and keep my water in there or what have you and of course you would take it home and it would start leaking right because there were cracks in it and eventually that wax would melt and uh, it would uh, start to leak and it would be a big mess it wasn't whole it wasn't the real deal okay so what Paul is saying here is that we're to approve things that are excellent we're to, we're to be able to judge to a say make sure it's the real deal and be sincere be the real deal okay what you would do what what folks would do is they would take 
that piece of pottery they were perhaps going to purchase and they would hold it up to the sun. If you hold it up to the light of the sun and the heat of the sun and you would see the cracks and you know what happened to that wax, it would start to melt from the heat of the sun and it, oh, okay, you would see that it wasn't the real deal. Guess what? Brothers and sisters, we're to be the real deal, okay? When folks see us, we're not putting on airs, there's no mask there, we're not being pharisaical. Uh, we're to be the real deal, we're to be sincere, we're to be without wax, we're to be solid, we're to be real. Without, uh, that you may be sincere and without offense, and again, he says, until the day of Christ, that day of perfection or maturity, where we are brought into uh, heaven with God and we take on the image of his son. Well, uh, that's enough for today. We're going to stop at verse 10. Uh, we'll pick up with uh, verse 11, Brother John will. And I think if we're lucky, Pastor Bedwell wants in on this too. So uh, the book of Philippians, uh, go ahead and read ahead. If you have a, uh, uh, a, uh, a study Bible, it might be nice to kind of read some of the notes and prepare yourself as we go through this together as a church. Again, let's uh, wrap up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this precious letter from Paul, uh, not just to the church at Philippi, but for us today uh, here all over uh, the metro area. Uh, again, be with our folks. May your word go out with power and authority. Help it to change lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll see you down the road.